But there was a man by name Johnny. He was a festival Christian, right? He would come to church, uh, particularly during festival times, and he would sit at the very last row, and when the pastor comes and prays his concluding prayer and gives a benediction when every eyes are closed, somehow Johnny would sneak out of the church. But it so happened in that particular day that uh, Johnny, it was so crowded and Johnny couldn't go out and the church service got over and pastor was standing at the entrance of the church and he was shaking the hands of everybody who had come in. So everybody came and of course Johnny was coming in, pastor shook the hand of Johnny and the pastor wanted to tell Johnny that, uh, he, that he would like him to be regular to the church but he didn't want to say it directly in the presence of others. So he looked at uh, Johnny and said, uh, Johnny, are you in the Lord's army? Okay? Are you in the Lord's army? And he said, uh, yes, pastor, I am in the Lord's army. Uh, then the pastor said, then how come I don't see you often in the church, in the house of God? How come I don't see you often? And Johnny looked around and he lowered his voice and he whispered in the ears of the pastor, he said, Pastor, I am in the secret service of the Lord. <laughs> right? There is nothing as secret service, right, uh, for the Lord. But there are moments when things become tough. There are moments when the opposition is great. There are moments when persecution is so rampant. There is a tendency, there is an inclination to somehow take our faith and go underground. But this morning I want to place before you a group of people. We do not know their names. There are hardly any description about this group of men. But these are men, these are the people of God who were instrumental in planting probably the greatest church the world had ever seen. These are ordinary people who when they had given themselves over into the hands of an extraordinary God, God took their lives and used them to launch this greatest church that would change the face of human history. So I'm going to talk about these people. I've titled my sermon this morning, Ordinary People in the Hands of an Extraordinary God. Ordinary People in the Hands of an Extraordinary God. If you have your Bibles, would you please turn with me to Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11, starting from verse 19. Acts 11, 19. Now those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed, traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word only among Jews. But some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. Now the book of Acts of the Apostles, which we commonly call as Acts of the Apostles, probably the right title could be Acts of the Holy Spirit of God through the Apostles or to make it much more correctly, probably the acts of the apostles through the people of God, because you would notice that how there are so many people whom God had used uh, apart from the apostles in the proclamation, in the evangelization of the nations. So this morning we turn our attention to that one particular group of people who are not the apostles, who are not a great people whose names are known, these are not people who have had theological degrees. These are not people who studied at SIAX or at SABC or in any other schools. But these are men and women of God who were committed to Jesus Christ and his gospel. And that is the reason we would see that how God used them to change the course of human history. 
Now, the book of Acts, as we know, in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, the central verse for the book of Acts, the Acts, the, the Luke, the historian records for us, as we know that verse, Acts 1, 8, when the Holy Spirit of God comes upon you, you will be my witnesses, right? You will receive strength, receive power, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So it's so important for us to realize that the coming of the Spirit of God, the giving of the Spirit of God to the church, has mission as its goal, as mission as its foundation. The day you and I forget of this biblical truth that the Spirit of God is given to the church, that the church may be strong, not for its own purposes, not for its own selfish consumption, but to be a witness for Jesus in this world. Now that's the reason why the Spirit of God was given to the church. The church was only 120 people, as we read in chapter 1, who were assembled on that day in the, high, in the upper room. Then we read in Acts chapter 2, the Spirit of God was given to the church. And the powerful preaching of the word by Peter, and we have another 3,000 added. And as you see, the church began to grow. But you notice what happened, the church began to grow only in Jerusalem, only among the Jewish people. But God's desire for the kingdom, as we see here, right, the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is that, that this Jesus movement would start in Jerusalem, but it would never stop in Jerusalem. It has to go to Judea, it has to go to Samaria, it has to go to the ends of the world. It must move not only among the Jewish community, it should spill over. It must intervene into the Gentile world. That was God's heart. That was the kingdom of God. If you notice the theme kingdom of God, or as Matthew would put it as kingdom of heaven, is what Jesus spoke the most during his earthly ministry. Now he is dead and he rose again in the 40 days. He had a 40-day seminar, right, for his apostles. He would come in and go. But you notice what was the central theme of Jesus' ministry to the apostles after his resurrection. For 40 days we read in Acts chapter 1 and in verse 3 that he spoke to them about, about what? About the kingdom of God. Right? He spoke to them about the kingdom of God, meaning the reign of God that is intervening into human history that has started in Jerusalem, but must spread to the ends of the earth. Amen. But listen now, what the apostles thought about the kingdom of God in Acts 1.6, after Jesus spoke about, you know, that the kingdom of God in 1.6, now the apostles looked at Jesus and said, Jesus... Are you going to restore the kingdom to what? To Israel, right? I want you to follow this carefully, right? Now Jesus talks about the kingdom of God and the apostles are saying, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Remember, these are Jewish people who had for centuries looking for the Messiah. The Messiah would come and he would defeat the Roman oppressors and he would set up the Davidic golden rule with Jerusalem as its headquarters. Now that was the expectation of the Jewish people. So now Jesus had died and he had defeated the greatest enemy, death himself. And now Jesus is resurrected. And so they are saying, Jesus, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And knowing the apostles for the three and a half years they were with Jesus, you also know that there was an undercurrent, there was an underplay of power. There was some power play happening here. I was trying to imagine probably the disciples thought, remember, these guys would, uh, you know, say who would often, they would fight, who would be number one. 
and the brothers would bring their mother and they would take the mother to Jesus so that the mother would intercede Jesus in your kingdom one of my sons should be on the right side and one of my sons should be on your left side right okay a constant uh, underplay of power among them so I was thinking probably the disciples would have thought hey now Jesus is going to set up an earthly kingdom Davidic rule with Jerusalem as its headquarters if Jesus would set up his earthly kingdom what kind of role would I play, right? Peter would have thought probably, hey, I'm the number one guy. Maybe I would be the prime minister, right? Of the kingdom that Jesus is going to set up, right? John, the second in command, I think he was a very homely guy who took Jesus' mother into his home. So he would have fancied himself to be the home minister, right? Of the kingdom that Jesus is going to set up. Matthew said, hey, I'm the tax collector. I have dealt with dollars and, you know, pounds and rupees. So I would be a good fit to be a minister for finance, right? Right? Finance. Now, Thomas was a guy who was always seeking evidence. So I thought he would be a good fit to be a minister for crime and justice. Right? Andrew was the one who brought a little boy with five loaves of bread and two fish. So I thought Andrew would be a good fit to be a minister for food and civil supplies, right? There was a guy by name Simon the Zealot, right? The Zealots were the armed revolutionaries of the time. So he said, hey, I have handled the AK-47s and the 56, and I would be a good fit to be a minister of defense, right? You could think any number of ways that these guys would have fancied that because there is an unmistakable underplay of power here. Why do I say that? Because you notice the answer that Jesus gave in Acts 1.8. He said, hey, when the Spirit of God comes upon you, you will receive power. You will receive power, but this is not the power that you are thinking of. This is not the earthly power to set up an earthly kingdom. But this is my power. And the power is given for only one purpose. That you would be my witnesses. The power is given to the church for nothing else. But to be God's witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You notice what happened. The church began to grow in Jerusalem, but it was largely confined within the Jewish community. Right? You notice how it grew and grew, but it was always confined within the Jewish community because many of the apostles and others thought that the kingdom of Jesus was primarily for those from the Jewish background. But as the church began to grow, I often say when a church or an institution or a movement begins to grow, Satan uses three powerful weapons against the church. The first weapon he uses is persecution. You notice in Acts chapter 3 and chapter 4, Peter and John were taken before the Sanhedrin and they were commanded not to speak in the name of Jesus. And they said, hey, we consider it as a privilege to suffer for Jesus. Would we obey him or you? Every time in human history, you notice, whenever the church had been persecuted, there has been a growth. That made the famous church father Tertullian to say that the blood of the martyr is the seed of the church. Interestingly, Acts 1.8, the word witness. When Jesus said, you will be my witness, the Greek word for it, martyria, is it from that you get the English word martyr. In other words, when Jesus said, hey, you will be my witnesses, he's saying, you will be my martyr. Being a witness is costly. So the first arrow, flaming arrow that was shot by Satan at the early church was persecution. The church withstood that. The second, the second powerful weapon in the armor of Satan, the second weapon is corruption. You look at Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira, the, the people within the church, very hypocritical and God had to act so powerfully and the husband and wife both fell dead in the church and we read a great fear fell upon the church we ought to watch out for corruption we ought to watch out for sinfulness 
the second powerful weapon Satan uses. But the third powerful weapon, probably the single most powerful weapon Satan has in his armor, the third great weapon is division. You come to Acts chapter 6. Now the church had grown and there are two groups of people within the church. Both of them were ethnically Jews but culturally they were different. They were the Hellenistic Jews and the Hebraic Jews. The Hebraic Jews were the people who were Jews who were born and brought up in Palestine who spoke Aramaic and who taught in, 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 in Hebrew worldview categories. The Hellenistic Jews were Jews who were born and raised outside of Palestine, who spoke Greek and who taught in Greek worldview categories. Both were Jews, but both were culturally very different. Both of them were in the church. And you notice how the split happened, or at least the attempt for a split over food, right? If you are not careful, my dear brother and sister, if you are not careful, Satan can't take anything, even a little thing about distribution of food. And he can try to bring, drive a wedge among the people of God. I believe the need of the hour today in the church is unity. But within our own congregation and within the larger body of Christianity in the church and in the world, that we need to be together. We need to watch out for we know how Satan operates. The Bible said, do not give Satan a foothold. You give him a foothold, he will turn it into a stronghold. Now, the church overcame it brilliantly. I don't have time to explain uh, you know, how the apostles approach, approach the issue of division as you see in Acts chapter 6. Brilliant, brilliant response to the, the attempt to divide the church. Now the church began to grow. If you notice by the end of chapter 6, we read that the church grew and many priests in Jerusalem became followers of Jesus Christ. You notice, and I'm actually taking you on a survey, right, of the book of Acts as we started in Acts 1 and now we come to Acts 7. And out of the seven that were came to take care of that feeding of the people, this man came to the forefront. We read about Stephen, right? We read about Stephen in Acts chapter 7. And you notice Stephen, the first martyr of the church. The largest, you know, there are several large, uh, uh, long speeches in the book of Acts. But the longest recorded speech in the book of Acts is the speech of Stephen. Because Stephen was not only the first martyr, he was also the first mission theologian of the church. We often think it was Paul, but it was Stephen. Let me tell you why. If you look at Stephen's speech at the end, why would they kill Stephen? Because Stephen touched a very raw nerve in the Jewish people. He said that this big temple that you, that your whole life is centered around. Remember, that was not only a center for the religious life, but also a center for their civic life, a center of finance, a center of their cultural life. But he said that God cannot live within a structure that has been put by human hands. And now Jesus, follow me carefully. Now since Jesus is dead and he is risen, now Jesus becomes the center and not this temple. Because of that is why this morning you and I can come together here and worship Jesus. Jesus told the Samaritan woman, one time a day will come where people can worship me anywhere. All they have to worship me in truth and in spirit. Right? You don't have to make a trek to, to, to Jerusalem to worship in the temple. Of course, they were not happy. Now, Jesus is the center. They took him out. And we are introduced to this young man who was standing there giving active approval for the killing of Stephen. I'm talking about Saul. First time we are introduced to Saul in chapter 7 towards the very end, right? He was guarding the clothes of those who were hurling these big stones at Stephen. 
and then he was giving approval and then we'll come to Acts chapter 8 1 I want you to quickly look at two verses before we move into Acts chapter uh, 9, 11 that was read to us okay two quick verses Acts chapter 8 and verse 1 Acts chapter 8 1 there was a great persecution broke out against the church a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. You notice all were scattered throughout the regions. All except apostles were scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. You notice here, where were they scattered? They were scattered to Judea and Samaria. Interestingly, isn't it this the first place that Jesus told you must go not only in Jerusalem but to Judea and to Samaria and to the ends of the earth? You see what the Lord is doing. Even in the midst of a painful, painful wave of persecution, the Lord is working out his larger purposes. I often say, God used Acts 8.1 to accomplish Acts 1a. Right? You would never forget this. There are moments when you go through tough times, when the opponents seem to be so strong, when persecution seems to be rampant, and you cry out and say, Why? Why, Lord? Do not be discouraged, my dear brother and sister, this morning. God is at work. God in his immeasurable wisdom in his incomprehensible power is carrying out his purposes in our nation and in the world for his glory hallelujah to the name of the living God when I meet with Christians when I meet with our own brothers when we meet with some churches when we meet with seminary students often say oh this is what's happening oh do you see how they have come do you see, did you ever thought they would get a majority? <laughs> yes. Yes. Do you see the minority syndrome that we have? The grasshopper syndrome we have. Oh, they look like giants. We are nothing but grasshopper in their sight. Yes. My dear brothers and sisters, God is at work. Even through difficult moments, God is at work. So God scattered the church into Judea and Samaria. But now you notice what is the response of the people? Acts 8.4. Acts 8.4, we read that wherever they went, right? Wherever they went, they preached the good news of Jesus Christ. Now that's why the church grew. Not simply because they were scattered church group, but wherever they went, they preached the word. They preached the word. So I'm going to bypass some very important things that happened later on the conversion of you know, uh, Cornelius and, and, and Saul to Paul and Peter and all kinds of things. But I'm going to jump to Acts chapter 11, right? two chapters, because this is where the historian is connecting this story, this incident for us. Okay, look at now Acts 11, 19. Luke is connecting this story with Acts 8, 4. Those who are scattered, okay? Those who have been scattered by the persecution when Stephen was killed traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus and Antioch. Now you notice spreading the word only among Jews. Okay. So this was the dominant practice of the early church. They thought the gospel, the kingdom is meant for the Jews. But look at these people. Where have they come now? They have come all the way to Antioch. Antioch was some 300 miles up north from Jerusalem. 300 miles up north of Jerusalem. Antioch was the third largest city in the Roman Empire of the time. It has got nearly half a million people. It was a big, big city known for its highly cosmopolitan culture highly known for all kinds of religions and deities and cults interestingly it was the birthplace of this great church right great church but unfortunately today if you go to Antioch you know it's a sad story in many ways where 
uh, you know, the current day Antioch is in Turkey, just at the very border of Syria. A few years ago, I was asked to speak and participate in a conference in Istanbul. I, I was there, and then I had always wanted to go to Antioch, and uh, so as I went on a tour to look at the seven cities that you see in Revelation 2 and 3, all of them are in modern-day Turkey. So I visited those cities, and then I had one more day. I decided to go to Antioch, uh, and I remember going to that place uh, today. Today is very, very different from what it was in those days. In those days, a bustling third largest city, imagine five lakhs of people, and into that city, now these people are coming. Okay, I want you to picture this. I want you to imagine this. And now you notice what you see, some of them, verse 20, some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks, to Gentiles also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. As I told you earlier, these were ordinary people. We do not even know their names. They are not apostles. They were not commissioned by the church in Jerusalem and sent to proclaim the good news. These were ordinary people whose names we do not know. And look at them. Some of them. A handful of them. If you want to talk about minority, this is minority. Some of them. A handful of them in a city of half a million people. Some of them. But you see what they did? What they noticed? This is what I want to uh, focus on. What did they do? They began to speak to Greeks, but what did they say? Telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The good news about the Lord Jesus. Imagine, it was this good news in human terms. It was this good news that brought, brought bad news for them. It was because of this good news, somebody lost their home. It was because of this good news, Stephen lost his life. It was this good news, somebody lost their business. Somebody lost their career in Jerusalem. It was because of this good news of Jesus Christ. They never kept asking, Lord, why, why? I just now put my children in the school. Why this persecution, Lord? I just started a business. It's flourishing. Why, Lord, I have to be uprooted from my place and I have to become a refugee within the Roman Empire? Why? It was the good news of the Lord Jesus. Humanly speaking, it brought bad news for them. But you notice what they did? You notice what they did? They proclaimed the good news of the Lord Jesus. My dear brothers and sisters, please listen to me this morning. The good news of Jesus Christ will always be the good news. No matter what happens to you, no matter what happens to me, but the gospel of Jesus Christ and his kingdom will always be the good news. The day the church in India, the day the church in the world grasps this truth. There is no good news apart from the good news of Lord Jesus. There is no good news you and I have to offer to the world except the good news of Jesus Christ. No matter what happens to you and me, this is always be good news. Isn't it? That's the glory. If you have known Jesus, you, you who have walked in Jesus, if you have understood the depth of your depravity and to the depth that he would descend to recover, to rescue you, you would appreciate this good news. Yes. There is no other good news apart from the good news of Jesus Christ. I wish the church, I wish every Christian would understand it, that this truth would be deeply embedded within their soul. The other day I was reading a book and I came across a very fascinating uh, illustration or story 
of uh, in Charles Spurgeon, who was considered the prince of preachers, you know, that tremendous, great man of God. And his grandfather, James Spurgeon, was also a pastor, and he was also a preacher. So, but now Charles has become so popular here to visit several churches to preach. So one evening he was supposed to preach in a place and his grandfather was also there. But Charles got tied up with something and he got delayed to come to the church. So James Spurgeon, uh, the, the, the elderly man, so they asked him to start the service. So he started the service and Charles was not around and James began to preach. He preached from Ephesians 2 that it is by grace through faith that you have been saved. As he was just getting into his sermon, he heard some rustling noise at the doorway and he could see his grandson Charles hurriedly walking in. He was so embarrassed that he got delayed, but uh, Charles Spurgeon was walking in and, and uh, the, fa the grandfather looked at the congregation and he said, Hey, here is my grandson. My grandson has finally arrived. And then he said, uh, well, he can preach the gospel better than me. He can preach the gospel better than me. But he cannot preach a better gospel than the gospel of Jesus Christ. Then he looked at Spurgeon and said, Charles Spurgeon, can you? Can you preach a better gospel than the gospel of Jesus? You and I can preach the gospel better. But we can never preach a better gospel apart from the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because there is no other good news. Nothing that we can offer to the world except the good news of Jesus Christ. And what he did on the cross. Look at these people. They lost everything. They lost their home. They lost their business. They lost their career. They lost everything, but they didn't lose their faith. They didn't lose their faith. They didn't lose their commitment. They didn't lose their love for Jesus. And they proclaimed the good news about the Lord Jesus. My wife and I lived for six years in America. I was doing my PhD in Asbury Theological Seminary. My PhD thesis was on uh, fundamentalism and persecution of the church in India. So that was my PhD thesis. And uh, I've been to several places. The last 20 years, I've been going to Orissa, Kandamal. Several of you know what happened in Orissa, Kandamal. I remember it was in 2007. 2008 was the big riot. But before that, in 2007, there was a smaller riot. I had come from U.S. to speak in a conference. When I heard that a particular you know, riot had happened, I wanted to go in there. It was just fresh. And I couldn't believe what I saw on that day. I couldn't believe how churches were burned down. Houses of Christians were broken. And, and, and you could see the carnage everywhere. But what broke my heart was when I went to a refugee camp under a yellow plastic sheet tent, there were hundreds of Christian brothers and sisters who were housed under the tent. I never imagined that one day in my own country, in my own nation, India, I would see men and women of God. I would see my brothers and sisters in Christ living as refugees under a shack. This is happening in our own land. And I spent some time with them. I prayed with them. And as I was coming out, I, I tried to encourage a man who was a pastor who lost his house, who lost his church building and all this stuff. But as he was about to go, he came and said, uh, uh, Brother Prabhu, we have lost everything. You know, I'm not bothered about it. He said this. He said, what pains me is that they have burnt 3,000 Bibles. And there is not a single Bible in this refugee camp. Would you please get me one Bible? Would you please get me one Bible? This man could have very well said, we do not have a place to live. Can you please build me a house? That was a legitimate request. He could have asked me, I don't have another set of clothes apart from what I'm wearing. Can you buy me new sets of clothes? That would have been a legitimate request. He could have asked, can you buy me some rice and dal and oil? We don't have another meal to have. And that would have been a legitimate request. But what did he ask? He says, 
can you give me one Bible? Dear brother and sister, let me tell you, that is why India is coming to Christ because of those men and women. The gospel, the kingdom of Jesus is spreading rapidly in a nation because precisely because of men and women like that. So I want to challenge you this morning. I want to challenge you this morning to a faith commitment. To a faith commitment that is far greater and beyond our own selves. Right? Sometimes we can be too caught up with our own things. Isn't it? Something happens, immediately we say, Lord, why? I would not come to church. I would not read the Bible. I would not pray. Why did this happen to me? They didn't ask that question, right? It's easy when you can get caught up with just the so-called blessings, the material things of life and forget the greater purpose to which you are called. It's so easy. It's so subtle if you're not careful. You know, in, in America, when you come, there are these big churches in front. You have this, all these big, uh, you know, uh, statements they write, you know, some kind of statement. So in front of one big church, they had written, Jesus only. Jesus only. Overnight, uh, a big hurricane came and it knocked off the first three letters. Okay. So the next morning when the curious onlookers gathered around, in big letters it said, what happens? us only right it's a slippery slope the church can very easily follow me carefully the church can very easily slip from claiming jesus only to us only the tragedy today in a nation is many christians many churches have moved away from jesus only and they're talking about us only oh if i come to christ what do i get what do I get? Or if I don't get this miracle, I don't want. I don't want this Jesus. Of course, Jesus is a God who does miracles without doubt. But my question is, are you following Jesus only? Follow me carefully. Are you following him only for the material and the physical realm? I heard about a ministry uh, that name, the name is Jesus Heals Mission. Okay. And they had a meeting somewhere and they put in big letters somewhere. They had written a billboard saying, Jesus heals mission. And the guy who was translating it to, into Kannada, he somehow got confused between uh, mission and machine. Okay. It's okay. So he wrote Jesus heals mission and underneath he translated in Kannada, Yesu Sugamaliku Yandira. Okay. I thought that was a good commentary on contemporary Christianity. Sometimes we have reduced Jesus to nothing but a miracle-making machine. He is a miracle worker without doubt. But remember, he is more than a miracle worker. He is Savior. He is Lord Jesus. Never lose sight of that. He is more than a miracle worker. Look at the three young men. Nebuchadnezzar had built this massive idol. I want you to bow down before it. No, we won't do. I'm going to turn up the heat seven times more. No. You know the story. But what was the reply? They said, O king, a God whom we worship is able to deliver from your hand. Right? That's a faith statement. He is able. But let me tell you the climax of faith, the culmination of faith. Sometimes we think, I prayed for something and I got it. That is the climax of faith. But let me tell you, at least for me, you pray for something and you don't get it and you still believe in Jesus. Now that's the climax of your faith. Because now you're not walking by sight, but you're walking by faith. My Lord has the power to deliver, but for some reason that if he does not deliver me, we will still love him. We would still follow him. We will still worship him. We will still serve him and we will still love him. 
Now, that is faith commitment. That is faith commitment. My God has the power to do. But even if he doesn't do, I'm not going to run around looking for the next church. I'm not going to run around looking for the next pastor. I'm not going to run around looking for the next miracle worker. I'm not going to run around look for the next church. But I am going to say, Lord, I will still love you, follow you, serve you, worship you. You see that church? That church will change India. That church will change the course of human history. They were scattered. They were persecuted. Yet they proclaimed the good news of Lord Jesus. Let me highlight quickly a couple of more points here and let me be through. You notice here how what they did was, there was not only you know, this commitment to Christ, but also you notice how they were innovative in gospel presentation okay they were innovative in the gospel presentation they never said hey the gospel was only for jews but some of them said why should the gospel be only for jews why don't we think about the greeks also Amen. the church grows continually when men and women of god who are able to lift their eyes beyond and say hey what about them what about them I was so delighted, I was talking with pastor when he said, our vision is to plant a thousand churches. The Lord has already blessed and we have more than a hundred worshipping groups around the country. Praise be to God. Amen. The church grows only when men and women of God are able to look beyond with eyes of faith and say, why only Jews, but why not Greeks? It was path-breaking, paradigm-shattering moment in the history of world mission. Not only that, how they approach, but you also notice how they proclaim the gospel. This is a quick, uh, because I'm an anthropologist by training, I teach culture, contextualization, so I get excited when I see some of these things. You notice how they presented the good news, it said, they presented the good news about the Lord Jesus. Now, it was not about Jesus the Messiah, Jesus Christ, right? Christ is Messiah. Because they are talking to Gentile people. A Jewish people would have understood immediately Jesus the Messiah. But they are talking to the Gentiles. So they took a term that was given to the highest authority. The Caesar was called as the Lord. So they took the term that was in that context and they applied it to Jesus. And they said so audaciously that Caesar is not the Lord, but Jesus is the Lord. Amazing, amazing men. Where did they get this wisdom? They were innovative. And look what the Lord did, verse 21. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. The Lord's hand was with them. Let me close with this. The Lord's hand was with them. No matter how articulate we are, no matter how innovative our presentation is, no matter how strategic our approaches are, no matter how great our oratorial skills are, but unless, unless the Lord's hand is upon you and me, you and I can accomplish nothing. The Lord's hand was upon them and great many people came to the Lord, right? It is the Lord's doing, right? That's why I always say forced conversion is an oxymoron because nobody can convert anybody. Only God is big enough to convert somebody. It is the Lord's hand and the Lord brought them. But the church has a responsibility. You cannot change anyone. So I often remind my fellow believers in Christ, I say this, remember, transmission of the gospel is our responsibility. Transformation of heart is God's responsibility. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Transmission. God will hold you accountable for the transmission of the gospel. It's between that person and the Lord. We never know when or how things are going to happen. But the Lord's hand was upon them. Great many people. So this morning, as we are in the Lord's presence, 
as a world in need of gospel, as a nation that is in need of gospel, this morning, would he say, Lord, I want to be that person. I want to be that person, Lord. Come what may. Come what may. Like a Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. I know my God is able. But even if he doesn't do, I will love him, worship him, and serve him. Lord, would you put that burden in our heart? Would you put that passion for people who have never heard the gospel even one time? Lord, would your hand be come upon me? Would you the weight of glory come upon me? Would your hand be come upon our church that we may see a move of God? Last year when I took over this responsibility to be the principal of the school. One of the things we did, my wife and I, along with a small team, is to usher in a movement of prayer among us. Because that has been deeply desiring to see God move in our community. To experience the revival, the church in India, to experience that revival. But one thing, let me tell you, wherever I go, I keep hearing that. Keep hearing here through pastor and his wife. I keep hearing, you know, even yesterday, remember, I was talking with the EFI general secretary. They came to took some interview of me. And they said, the next 10 years, we are going to announce 10 years of prayer and revival in India. The Lord is doing something. And remember, prayer, prayer precedes revival. We are so delighted to see the chain of prayer here. Go to knees. Go hold on to God. Say, Lord, we are so small. The task is humongous. Would your hand come upon us, Lord? Would your glory come upon the church? Would you hold on to God? So we've launched this chain prayer at Syax. We started with morning nine till evening six every day. Half an hour slot is put and people right from faculty to staff and students are praying. And we are working on next year, go, hopefully, we would have a 24-7 chain prayer around the world. Amen. Why? Because the Lord is moving the hearts of people around the world to unite in prayer, seeking the hand of the Lord. Today, as we come into the presence of God, would you say, Jesus... We want to be that people. Come what may, Lord. Come what may. We want to be your witnesses. Let me close with a true story. You know, there are sometimes I read a book and I have to close down and I have to cry uncontrollably. And this was one of those incidents. It was this big book written by a man called uh, Samuel Moffat, The History of Church in Asia. More than 1,000 pages. You know, I don't pretend to read the whole thing. But uh, let me tell you from what I read. Towards the very end of this two-volume masterpiece of the history of the church in Asia, he gives an anecdote from the Burmese church. Remember Adoniram Judson who went and who God used him to move among the Karen community. Now, you know, after the period of Adoniram Judson, the Karen people, a tribal community that has come to Christ in huge number. But a Karen community was going through a very difficult phase in their lives. A plague of rats have swept through the Karen lands. It has destroyed all their food grains and the Karens were going through tremendous starvation. Starvation to such an extent they began to catch hold of the rats that have eaten the food grain and they began to cook the rat and eat the meat of the rat. This is the people of God, Karen community in Burma. But then one day, a Karen elder approached an American missionary who was staying there. He had his fist that was folded, that was clenched. He came to the American missionary, took his hand, and he placed his fist, and he put some money that was in his hand, and he put it in the hand of the American missionary and said, Sir, we hear 
that you are planning to start a new mission station among the Caucasians. That is another tribe living up north of them. They said, we heard that you are starting a new mission field up among the Caucasians. Here is the contribution of the Karen church. The missionary was horrified. He said, no, I can never take this money. You guys are surviving by eating the rats. I cannot receive the money. And this is what the Karen elder said. He said, sir, we Karens, we can live on rats. But the Caucasians cannot live without the gospel. Lord, sir, we can live on rats. But the Caucasians cannot live without the gospel. Where all the men and women of God this morning would say, we can survive on anything, but a nation cannot live without the gospel. Where all the people this morning would say, Jesus, I want to be that person. I want to be that person used by you. I'm an ordinary person, Lord, but I surrender my life to you this morning. Would you take me and use me for your glory?